All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm uh, really excited to, uh, to talk to you today, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, I am here to talk to you today about um, a couple of things. One, the experience of being a woman in archaeology in Alaska, specifically, which is just a uh, uh, a really frontier place. Um, and so talking a little bit about that and then sharing my thesis research, which um, specifically looked, which looked at um, tools from the Broken Mammoth site in interior Alaska, uh, the osseous tool technology that um, I think, I'm pretty sure, um, indicates the presence of a, a, a woman's tool making kit and shows evidence for women doing, not tool making, Clothing production. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. I'll I'll get with it though. Um, but um, the gist of this whole presentation today is just to be really easy, and I'm going to share some stories and get a little bit into the science. But this is not like a super techie archaeology talk. Um, that's in my thesis, which is available to be read, and there's lots of details about the more hard science stuff. But what I really wanted to share with you was how being a woman in this very specific place um, moved me uh, towards a more engendered uh, archaeological interpretation for my, for my research. Because I really believe fundamentally that as archaeologists, who we are individually uh, impacts everything that we do and all of our interpretations. So I think to know um, the actual practitioner of archaeology is to know better how they're looking at the archaeological record. So um, it's going to be weird. I'm going to talk a lot about myself, which feels a, a little strange, but it's because I want you all to know me in a way that helps you understand um, where archaeology, what the kind of archaeology that I do, and um, to just be really conscious that you cannot do archaeology in a vacuum and who you are um, will always impact how you do um how how you do your science um because science is not neutral so um these are just a couple of pictures of different places i've done field work i've done museum work historical archaeology um contract archaeology all all sorts of stuff um so i'm going to start kind of at the beginning of my experiences in alaska and where where i started um and that is at the Little John site in Yukon. Um, this is one of the most beautiful places you can imagine. It's right on the border of Alaska and Canada um, in a little community called Beaver Creek. And Beaver Creek is a very important place to me. It has many of my good, good friends live there. It, um, it was my real introduction to Alaskan archaeology. And I always kind of knew that I wanted to do Alaskan archaeology or Beringian archaeology because when I was an undergrad, I was like super into the Ice Age, which I think a lot of people are. It's an amazing time period. And like you wanna, you want to, you want to talk about it. It's so fascinating. And you've got like all those extinct megafauna. It's just, I mean, it's a it's a time period where your imagination can really run wild. And I love love that about archaeology. Um, so I came from Knoxville, Tennessee to Yukon. Um, and I grew up in Seattle, so like definitely big city world, but came to Yukon for 10 weeks. And um, at the same time that it was this amazing experience, it was also a real awakening into how different things were going to be. Um, on like the first night out at the field site, um, oh, and I should also, um, I guess a very brief content warning. This is all an appropriate discussion. Um, I, I'm keeping things pretty light, but I am gonna talk about sexual harassment and like gender-based harassment a little bit. Um, not the focus, but it, ha it happened. So we're gonna talk about it. Um, so first night we're out here and the field director who is a man gathers us all up and goes, I need to know when you're menstruating. And I just kind of blink a little bit and he goes, because menstruation can attract bears. And 
you know, come to find out a couple years later, the science is out on that. Um, <laughs> but um, the way it was presented was not just so you know, menstruation menstrual products can be a bear attractant. Do what you need to do to mitigate that risk. It was, I need to know when, when you're on your period. Um, and oh boy, <laughs> you, you suddenly have this realization that, um, I mean, not even really suddenly, it was more of a creeping realization that like, this is different. I'd worked in remote field settings before I'd worked in, um, field settings with wild animals before. And never once had I had somebody tell me that they needed to be aware of when I was on my period. Um, and you know, it was kind of like a yellow flag for how the rest of the field project went with this particular field director. Um, but on the other hand, I did have a couple of experiences at Little John that were um, really transformative. And one of them was uh, the, the field camp is very much Im embedded in the community, which is a wonderful experience. You're doing community archaeology in a way that, um, this was a long time ago, this was like 2009, so before community archaeology as like a thing really kind of came up. And um, one of the things that happened was one of the women in the community um, snagged a moose and she needed some help butchering it, taking it apart, packing it in. And so they were like, oh, a bunch of young, able-bodied college students, let's grab them. So we all went out to, um, to help pack it, pack out the moose and then process it. And um, I was asked to stay behind while they were packing stuff out, um, uh, with some of the women and, um, the, the Johnny family in Beaver Creek are the, the nicest people. Um, and we were sitting underneath kind of like a, like a, a little pop-up tent kind of things to keep bugs away and to just have a place to work with a big old white plastic table, um, cutting up moose. And it was all women. Um, I was probably the, the youngest one of the group, but we were all just like chatting and talking and laughing and teasing each other about the process of cleaning out moose guts, which is basically just like, you get the gut, you stretch it out a little bit and you, you know, it's, it's a little gory, um, but it's really fun. And, um, sitting in a community of women like that, working together to accomplish a goal is, um, you know, on also like on a beautiful Alaska summer, like Yukon summer day, right? Like 70 degrees. It's just perfect. It's like a perfect day. Um, and, you know, living in Alaska for a while, you kind of learn that there is this really community experience of food processing in most Alaskan cultures and all Alaskan cultures, including like white people Alaskan culture like food food procuring subsistence life is is communal and um yeah I think that 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 definitely is a story that is like super formative in my um in my archaeological experience and and just in my life experience it was a great great moment um so that happened I went back I did this when I was still an undergrad I went back to UT finished up and then I moved to Alaska and I got a job as an intern at the state of Alaska. And, okay, and this is um, a project that I was on with the state. And I loved working at the state. It was one of my favorite jobs. I was really, really lucky. I got to go all over Alaska. Um, and this is um, in the kind of the foothills, the Brooks Range. It's Northern Alaska, beautiful tundra. But um, where do you pee uh, when you are, on a field crew where um, I had one other woman on this project with me, but it was a mostly male field project. And as you can see, wide, wide open space. I'm, these are my coworkers. So I'm standing pretty far away, right? And you just are like, what, what do you even do? Like the, you have to think about these things for all field work and you should think about these things for all field work. Like there's no reason not to have a plan for how to use the bathroom. Um, but sometimes the plan is just telling your coworkers not to turn around, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is just, yeah, that's what you got to do. <laughs> and it's just another one of those things where you're like, 
this is a different experience for me as a woman. Like, I, you know, this is, as a cis woman, like, this is something that I, I have to deal with. Um, and I think it's a, kind of a hoot. Um, and like I said, this was a great crew of people and it was a fine experience, but you just are, you just got to deal um, in a way that you don't really think about uh, until you're in the moment and you really have to pee and you're standing on the tundra. Um, so uh, a couple years later, um, I worked on a project in Kotzebue, which is in Northwest Alaska. Um, and it was a really heavy emotional project. We, um, we had to, the, the project included, um, with community consent and consul consultation, um, we had to relocate human remains because they were putting an airport extension that was vital to the community. Um, and that's not the kind of work that I got into archaeology to do, but it was the archaeology that needed to be done at the time. And um, this project, honestly, it wrecked me in a lot of ways. Um, and I think the thing that got me through it, where you can see our feet here, um, were the women on the crew. By the time I started, it was kind of the, the project was wrapping up and uh, for the most part, it was an all, an all female crew. And part of the kind of way of being in Alaska, especially if you're a girl and especially if you're from outside Alaska is to be the toughest you can be. Like there's lots of like Alaska girls kick ass and it's very, very strong. You have to be a very strong woman to live there in a lot of ways. And I am not really that, not really that kind of person. I'm super emotional. I feel all my feelings really strongly. I am not a badass like at all. And, um, this project really brought out um, the kind of emotions that are hard to process in a work setting. And, you know, there are days when you would go off site and you just needed to take 15 minutes and just cry. Like it was just a lot. And um, the support of the women on that project uh, really made a big difference because it was okay to just say like, okay, I need to take I need to take a little bit of a break to feel these feelings. Um, and it was also a place that I'd worked before, um, but I was there for a long time on this project. And um, it is a really important place to me. It's, I mean, it's beautiful there, right? Like this is the end, this is the end of September. So right around this time of year actually. Um, and it is, there's nowhere like it on earth. And so it was, it meant, it meant the world to, to be able to be there with the kind of people who also recognized that these things matter and that your feelings about them are, or that not these things, but that doing this kind of archeology span that is super destructive and can be very harmful, um, you know, that they acknowledge that you can have feelings about it, which you don't always get. So a couple more years later, uh, not doing an archaeology project, but doing a, um, a social impact assessment with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, right? Boom, that's Boom's long name. Yes. Um, we were at the, we were on the North Slope in communities in the North Slope borough um, for the winter. And um, Burr, one, and uh, two, this was a really uh, great experience because we were um, basically going door to door with like a huge interview protocol to check up on people. The um, BOEM has to do a like a community baseline study every 15 years to assess the impacts of oil leases in the North, uh, in the North Slope Borough. Um, so we interviewed heads of household in um, Ukiagvik, Wainwright, Point Lay, Point Hope, and I think, I think those are, those are the communities that I worked in. I think there were more um, for the project in general. And um, there are a couple of experiences that I want to talk about on this project. Um, one was in Ukiagvik. Um, 
working with a, um, the, the heads of household were all self-identified. So we just like knocked on the door and said, hey, can your head of household talk to us? And completely fairly, a lot of people didn't have the time of day for us. And there is lots of information about kind of the research fatigue in the North Slope and actually all around Alaska and with most native communities, I think like people are, are tired of people coming up and being like, hi, I have questions for you. Um, it helped because we had 50 bucks to give people and that was nice and the opportunity to tell the government what you think. So that was kind of a good sell. But um, I had one interview where um, I went into this house and it immediately hit me because it was like going into my grandma's house. Like it looked really similar. And the head of household was a Nupiat woman who didn't speak much English. So our conversation was translated by her daughter. And her daughter was around my mom's age and she was around my grandmother's age. And um, she was, they, they were so much fun. Like we, the interview protocol usually took about 45 minutes, but we ended up spending about an hour and a half together. And um, it, the, the woman, um, the head of household, she was really funny and she really liked to kind of crack jokes at what I was doing, but I don't speak in Yupiat, so I didn't know the jokes. And so she and her daughter would laugh and then she would tell her daughter to translate the joke so I could also laugh. Um, and it was this really fun experience of just like drinking tea, hanging out. And um, I'd been on the North Slope for a month or so at that point. I was feeling really homesick. I usually see my family in the winter um, and didn't get a chance to do that yet. And so it was, um, I actually like cheesily enough kind of wrote a Facebook post about it that I came up on my Facebook memories the other day. And it was, um, you know, I, I talked about how being surrounded by indigenous women, um, even if the language is different, even if our colonizers are different, feels really good. I was raised by my, you know, I was raised by my mom and close to my grandmother who are Mexican native. And it was this very like, oh, right, this is, this is what feels good um, kind of thing. And it's the same, same moment where you're working with women and you are talking to women and working with other women is kind of the resiliency you need to be in this, this world. Um, the other story that I wanted to tell is just more of a funny one um, about a, another community on the North Slope um, in Wainwright. And we, part of the way that we did this project was we hired um, local folks to come with us to do translation work and to like help code interviews and um, they're long, they're long hitches in man camps, right? And um, when you stay in like an Arctic man camp, like they're, um, they're like for the oil production and oil industry. So it is really like, especially in the winter time, like men on long hitches in you know, they don't, they don't really love being there, a lot of them, and they're kind of unpleasant sometimes, not always, but like sometimes they're kind of unpleasant, and um, the folks in Wayne Marine Camp were really nice, but we ended up having another all-woman team, including the um, woman from Wainwright, Joy Nyakic, who is a blast, and it turned into this, you know, you'd come back at night, and everybody would kind of hang out in the room together and avoid the dudes at the camp and just like gossip and talk and just get a chance to, to decompress. And these kind of like decompression moments that you get when you do archaeology or anthropology with other women are so great and so much fun and needed. So this is just a little rotating slideshow of the amazing woman that I've worked with in archaeology. And I wanted to show some of these pictures because um, I had a colleague when I was um, doing my comprehensive exams. And there, I had to like make this timeline of, or I wanted to make a timeline to like help me work out um, some chronology stuff for what I was doing my exams on. It was a really stressful time period in my life because comprehensive exams are really stressful. 
and I had it all laid out. I was like working in the lab and this guy who was two cohorts below me in grad school walks up to me and he's like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And first of all, that wasn't the point of the timeline. Like I wasn't reanalyzing this, this, this chronology. I was just, um, I was just memorizing it because I needed to repeat what I read. And I was like, okay, well, nobody asked you. And then he said, I don't know why you're bothering. I wouldn't take women in the field anyway. And like, this is not an old person. Like, this is not an old man. This is somebody who is my age, maybe a couple years older. And I was like, oh. And he said, well, they just don't have the stamina or the intellectual capability to really be archaeologists while I was studying for my comprehensive exams. And that attitude in a lot of men in Alaskan archeology span really exists. That women and our bodies are a liability in the field because we are fat, I've been told that, too fat to do archeology. span That we are, um, you know, the, the whole menstruation thing is a liability in the field. Um, that we are not strong enough, that we are not enough. And you build up this kind of shell around you when you have to do a job like this in the wilderness, the wilderness. We don't have time to get into the whole concept of wilderness, but in the wilderness. And you build up this shell and it stinks. It's a really hard shell, especially for, maybe not for everybody, but for someone like me who is just the girliest girly girl who, I mean, ever, could girly girl like my mom when I became an archaeologist was like what like what do you do like how you have to go outside to do that job um and I met so many amazing women in Alaskan archaeology and kind of the moral of the story is um there will always be terrible terrible people that you have to work with in this field um Unfortunately, archaeology is really good at attracting, especially Alaskan archaeology, attracting people who think they're cowboys and who think that they are like, you know, you have to carry a gun sometimes when you do Alaskan field work because there are bears and moose. And man, do they love that. And you get this whole attitude from people that is, I think, detrimental to the science and also horrible for your coworkers. Um, but for me, at least, the best thing ever that happened to me in Alaska was meeting all of these amazing women who heard, I'm sure, very similar things to the thing I heard and went, nah, we're still going to do it. Like, we're still, we're still here and we're absolutely going to be part of this community. Um, and I share all of that um, because my gender uh, is very much a a framework for how I think about interpreting archaeology, especially in um, like the way back past. So um, when we talk about the Pleistocene, so the end of the last ice age and the transition into the Holocene, um, a lot of the questions that we ask ourselves are these really big questions. They're about the peopling of the Americas, they're about populations, they're about um, migration. They're all about all of these big questions that um, are interesting questions, but I don't, they're not interesting to me. I am sharing this quote here, which was kind of a guiding, uh, a guiding point for my thesis, which is that um, archaeology is really great at getting into the day-to-day -day experience of people's lives. And um, if you think about your life, everything you use has um, meaning, like, you know, it doesn't always seem like it, but we, we are close to our material culture. And um, I think the questions about like, you know, how'd you pick this cup are really fun. And that's kind of what I wanted to get at in a, um, in, and in a subdiscipline of archaeology that's really interested in the bigger questions. Um, so we have that kind of guiding principle. And then um, I also want to talk about another guiding principle, which is this idea of like the Paleo-Indian imagination. And I think everybody who's interacted with the idea of like the Ice Age has, has seen this dude. And these are great paintings, so I don't wanna like knock the artists, but um, when we think of like the Ice Age and the Paleo-Indian time period, what 
you immediately think of is like guy on a ridge with a spear, maybe some hair blowing in the wind, looking down at some mammoths or hunting mammoths or hunting megafauna. Um, you have this kind of explorer odyssey kind of mentality that you think about. Um, it's really lonely. Um, a lot of times you don't see people in community in depictions of, uh, of the Ice Age. And um, I would like to argue that there is a strong element of um, American culture in this. Um, I think that what we've done when we talk about the past like this is, is we've taken kind of the American ideal of, man, ideal of manifest destiny and transposed it onto people in the past who did not have the same idea of, you know, go west, young man. Um, and uh, when we have this picture in mind, when we look at the archeological record, um, we're, we're gonna miss stuff. We're gonna we're gonna miss things. Um, we we don't look for them. We don't look for other people. We don't um, try out other narratives. And there are lots of people who um, who lived outside this solitary man on a ridge life. I think everybody lived a life outside a solitary man on a ridge life. Um, and for a long time, the the title of my thesis that I saved in my computer was women in the ice age, they existed. <laughs> and like, I know that's true because I, I exist. So, you know, I, my mom exists, my grandma exists. We all were, you know, we're all descended from women who existed in the, Amer in the Americas during the Pleistocene. And we don't really get to see ourselves represented in that. And um, what I wanted to talk about with Broken Mammoth were the women that undoubtedly existed there. Um, and there's this other thing that happens, I think, in archaeology that we use this kind of passive, passive voice, this kind of sciencey voice that erases um, gender and identity. And it's a, it's a good protection, um, but the default, because we live in a patriarchal white society, is that our default is that, that dude. Um, and I didn't want to talk about that. So, we are going to breeze through some background about Broken Mammoth. So Broken Mammoth is in interior, the interior of Alaska um, on the Tanana River. It's a, um, a place with really rich archaeological history, uh, especially for that time period between about 15,000 years ago and about 9,000 years ago. Um, you can see it's just here, just outside of Fairbanks, in a general sense. Um, so Broken Mammoth is a deep site with um, pretty clear, though complex, stratigraphy. So what you end up having is um, cultural zones with a separation of sterile lusts going down further and further. And um, we're going to focus on uh, the two deepest cultural zones of Broken Mammoth, which represent the time periods. Um, like cultural zone three is around 12,000 to about 10,000 um, years before present. And then cultural zone four is just a bit earlier than that. Um, so Katie Krasinski has done um, a, for her, her master's thesis research, did a great job um, doing kind of a spatial analysis of um, the technology that we found at Broke, that they found at Broken Mammoth and had an idea for how um, the, how Broken Mammoth was organized. So you have these um, hearth workshop areas with, um, this is NCZ3 with a semi-permanent base camp occupation, lithic tool manufacture and stone processing with frequent faunal processing. So lots of fauna, um, which is also really unique for this area. Like there's great faunal preservation. Um, and based on the fauna, um, looking at like a fall and early winter occupation for um, culture zone three. So culture zone four, which is older, right? Um, has a similar paleo environment um uh, but a, a different kind of a different um like area of, of time period of occupation so um we have more fauna in cz4 than we had lithics um and a spring some fall and early winter so you're looking at like pretty regular um regular life at broken mammoth there were people there um for most of the year 
over this kind of big, big time period. Um, it's kind of chilly and wet for both, uh, both paleoenvironmental reconstructions. Um, so, you know, you, you want to have some, some good warm clothes for dealing with a cold, wet interior Alaska fall and early winter. So these are the tools I analyzed. You'll notice that there are not a ton of them. Um, they are, at the time that I wrote my thesis, the, the largest collection of organic tools from this time period in interior Alaska. Um, and like I said, there's not a lot of them. So you're looking at these really small uh, sample sizes, which is tough to do because so much of archeology span is looking at um, like big aggregate data, like trying to get, um, get a, get a lot of information in there. But we don't have that for these kind of materials. Most of these are made of um, mammoth ivory or antler, except for the needle, which we'll talk more about, which was made of, um, I think, bird bone. So what I did was I wanted to understand how these tools were made and how they were used. And what I tried to do was use a microscope to get an idea of what um, kind of where was on the tools to help me understand how they're made, what they're used for. Um, I took a bunch of pictures, took a bunch of micrograph pictures, and it turns out that I couldn't really do that because at some point after these artifacts were excavated, somebody dunked them in glue. And they didn't use a, um, like a, a consolidant that you would use if you were a conservator. Um, they just did a dunk. And no one wrote down what kind of glue they used and no one was willing to tell me what kind of glue they used. They just kept insisting that it was um, butvar, which is the consolidant, but like it's not, butvar doesn't make shiny glassy rainbows on top of your artifacts. Um, so I actually had like a year of my thesis that I diverted or my research time diverted trying to figure out if I could safely remove the glue from the objects to do the artifact analysis that I wanted. Um, and I couldn't, couldn't figure out what the glue was. I like borrowed a PXRF and like tried to shoot them to see if I could like get a signet chemical signature on the, on them to figure out what kind of glue it was like it just didn't it didn't work out so um yeah these pictures here are an illustration of why if you are an up-and-coming archaeologist don't dunk your bone tools in glue just just don't um so I'm not going to talk about every artifact because I want to um be conscious of time no Fast. Oh yeah, I gotta, gotta scram, scramble. Um, but I did want to focus on this needle really quickly because I think that this needle is a really special, um, a really special tool. It's the um, there are only a handful of eyed bone needles in um, anywhere in the Pleistocene, um, and there's only one in Alaska, and it's this one, and it is beautiful. And you can actually see when you get it under the microscope, you can see that it's a gouge needle, so they um, rather than like, or a drilled needle, not a gouge needle. So they, you know, they drilled out this tiny eye on this little piece of bone. Um, it's only like this big uh, to make it. And we're gonna zoom, we're gonna zoom forward. So one of the things that you can see is that it's probably a decorative sewing implement. You're not like stitching together a giant pair of pants with this or stitching up a tent. Um, you're probably using it for applique or embroidery. So keep that in mind and then we have these that are blunted um, projectile points. So the, the business end of the point is actually the, the blunt part. And this is the part that's hafted. There are two of those in this little collection, which is the other one that I've shown here. Um, so you can kind of see the hafting wear there. Um, so I decided that we've got this tiny sample size. You can't talk much about the archeological like tool making bits of this. So what, what am I going to talk about? Like, I'm not going to skip talking about this amazing needle, right? Like, I'm, I got to talk about it. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, and I got into the idea of um, just intentionally looking for something um, and being clear that that's what I'm doing and proposing something, um, which is that that's a decorative sewing needle. It's likely that women did decorative sewing work. Um, and then you know, just actually saying it rather than saying, well, we've got one needle, we can't say anything. Um, so I did this thing where I asked myself questions about how I got there because I wanted to be clear in my thesis about how I got there. 
And um, like I said a little bit before, these are my, this is my mom and my grandmother and my other grandmother. And um, the reason that I wanted to talk about women is because I am a woman. I was raised by very, very strong women. Um, and I didn't see myself or my ancestors represented in my discipline, hardly ever. Um, let's see what I got on time. Okay, so really fast. There was this article that came out in National Geographic in, in 2015. And a couple of you will have heard this story because I tell it a lot because it enrages me. And it was the story of a woman that was found, a young woman, like a girl that was found in, an, uh, in a cenote in Mexico. And um, they had her as like a cover story in National Geographic. It was this great cover too. Like she was like looking behind her, she was active in the illustration, it was really, really neat. It was called like the first Americans. It was, it was an awesome looking cover. And then you get into it and they interview this archeologist who has this totally awful interpretation of what life must have been like for women in the end of the ice age based on this one skeleton. Um, and he had this whole thing about like, um, women the women in these groups being like diminutive and submissive and the men being strong and dominant because of intergroup competition for access to females as if we are a resource and who boy was i mad about that um because sure there are lots of diminutive women but to paint the entirety of women from like not just this woman specifically but he had this whole thing about like how all the women in the North America, Central America, were part of this North, or like, what do you call it, North American wild man type. And just like, ho horrifying. Like, I, I don't know if I can be clear enough, but it was awful. And like, you know, if you look at a skeleton of a small woman or a young woman, you can't, you can't get the idea that she is submissive or diminutive. Like, what? I don't think I would ever describe myself as submissive or diminutive and I'm not tall. So what are you, what are you doing? Anyway, I, this was in my mind. I finished my um, thesis in 2017. So this was like very fresh in my mind when I was thinking about this. Um, so then I went through and I did this thing um, where I looked at a bunch of different ethnography from um, the Northern, Northern areas. So the Arctic and subarctic. Um, and, uh, there is a great, uh, dissertation, um, by this woman whose last name is Ruth and I can't remember her first name. Um, but she basically found by doing a bigger ethnographic analysis that what happens when you get to gender divisions of labor is that they increase the farther away you get from the equator. So basically the harder it is to live, harder it is to live in an environment that requires more cooperation you're gonna get divisions of labor because not everybody can be an expert in every single thing. Um, and so I kind of copied that idea and I made, oh, this is just to get the idea of like, it's cold, you have to be really good at making clothes to live in the Arctic in the winter, it's very cold um, and also very pretty. So I made um, this, uh, oh, this picture did not transfer well, I'm sorry. Um, Anyway, I did this, I called it an ethnographic activity matrix. I went through all these things. I looked at clothing production and tool manufacturer for clothing production, who was it used by, who were the things processed by, who collected everything. Um, and there's pages of this in my thesis. And what I basically found was that men and women participated unequally in raw material procurement. procurement. Um, women participated in small mammal hunting, active support rules for large mammal hunting. Um, women processed animal hides with some support by men, men conducted tool manufacture, women worked with perishable furs. Um, and then I also described um, what that kind of clothing would look like to really drive home the point that you have to be good at making clothes. Uh, and then I also looked at um, how, what clothing meant, like how clothing was significant to people, um, which is really fascinating. And then um, this is just to wrap it up because I, I talked for too long. Um, so what I ended up concluding in my thesis was that the tools at Broken Mammoth represent a um, small mammal hunting kit 
Um, you have those blunted points that um, people used for getting little fur bearers or bur sometimes birds. Um, there are lots of bird bones, lots of small mammal bones. Um, you've got that needle and then um, some of the uh, artifacts I didn't show you are probably uh, handles or um, one of them I think is a, a handle for a flenser or like a multi-tool for flensing, which is removing the fat from a hide. Um, and where was I going? Oh, so um, what you kind of see the picture of is a clothing manufacturer. And I, I, I think, and it's always just a guess. Like, honestly, archaeologists, we all have to just really admit to ourselves that what we're doing is telling educated guest stories. But um, I think that it looks like there was probably a woman sitting there making something and probably making something really beautiful. Um, and those needles are well cared for, right? Like that needle is, it has a little break through the eye, um, but you know, you use them for a long time and you care for it. And those tools um, are used to create beautiful things. And um, you start to see, once you kind of like zoom into these little things, the rest of the picture behind that guy standing on the hill, it's that, He's standing on the hill in his clothes with his tool because there are a whole community of people with him that make clothing, process the food that he catches, that um, that care for him, and they all, you know, people care for each other, and you you can kind of see that once you start looking at these little these little questions instead of like the really big ones, um, and. Yeah, that is my, yep, that's 12.49. So I uh, got pretty close to on, on schedule there with a, I, I realized that I like went through a lot of the archeology span part really fast. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I am happy to answer more questions afterwards if you want to know more things or I can send my thesis, I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the story. Um.